Good morning. <clears throat> Let's find out who we are here for this creativity on demand. How many of you here are mind mappers? Excellent. <clears throat> How many of you are still making mind maps? How many of you have done mind maps and are not doing mind maps? Okay. How many of you have never done a mind map? Okay. How many of you daydream? Aha. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so more daydreamers than mind mappers. <clears throat> How many of you daydream every day? Very good. How many of you enjoy your daydreams? <clears throat> How many of you have already had a daydream in this seminar room with me? <laughs> How many of you have had a daydream with me here? So two of you. So two of you. Which means that 98% of you are liars. <laughs> <laughs> I had a daydream as well when I was with you already. So we'll focus on daydreaming. How many of you have children? Is daydreaming in school considered good or bad? Bad. Daydreamers, so you're all bad. Off to a very interesting beginning of the day. <clears throat> How many of you are artists? How many of you are not artists? Okay. How many of you are scientists? Six hundred are not scientists. Okay. How many of you are poets? Four. How many of you are not poets? Wonderful. So just imagine the planet Earth for the rest of the future ruled by you. A team, a government of basically no artists, no poets, no scientists run by you. Have a think. Why are you where you are now? Why are you there? So I'm going to tell you a story about me and why I am here and therefore on one level why you are here as well. And this is to do with intelligence creativity, smart, etc. And when I was seven, how many of you have been to one of my lectures before? Okay. How many of you have been with me personally in a seminar? How many of you have been online with me? Okay. How many of you tweet? Okay, I'm on Twitter and some of you have asked me even before we started, how do we stay in touch? The best way to stay in touch with me to begin with is Twitter. I thought some few years ago that Twitter was a, a waste of time. And it was described as people just wasting their time and everybody else's time. There were tweets like, you know, it's 3.15 in the afternoon, I have just been to the toilet, and I like this team of football, which didn't really add to the planet's knowledge or drive its future or inspire its creativity. But then I began to think, if one tweets only, only to do with that which helps the world, then it spreads like a mind map. You've got the center of your idea, and you radiate out with those thoughts. So <clears throat> my Twitter, my Twitter, can you re-interfere because I need my hands to. 
Twitter is at Tony underscore Buzan. And what I will do, when you retweet or tweet something that is mentally literate, that has a really good mind map in it, that tells a story about a child's development, I will retweet you. I will retweet you. It's a treatment, and therefore you can contact me, and nearly every day I will retweet what has been going on in the field of creativity, learning, and thinking. So back to school. When I was in school, I didn't like school. When I was seven, I didn't like school. How many of you, when you were in school, when you were, say, seven years old, didn't really like school? I hated some of it, but there were four things every day that I did like. I loved ding 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 ding, ding. <laughs> the playtime bell. And then the second thing I loved was ding 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 ding, ding lunchtime bell. Third thing I loved, ding 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 ding, playtime bell. And the one I really loved was ding 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 ding, ding school finished. And we were all like athletes, track athletes, in the starting blocks, waiting to get out. By the way, I do recommend good thought. And there are more seats nearer here, so you'll be able to hear me probably more clearly. When I came out of school, I ran into fields, woods, by the streams and rivers, because my only interest, my only passion, was nature. I belonged to the RSPCA, EBSA, and I used to collect and study all forms of living creatures. I had a best friend with a boy called Barry, and we'd run into the fields, and my friend Barry would make things fly. And when birds and butterflies flew, you could identify them as they went on the horizon by swipe map. You could identify the difference between, say, a red admiral and a peacock butterfly by swipe map. On the horizon, you can distinguish the body and flight of a blackbird and such. Same size, and on the horizon, they look the same. He was incredibly fast. He black lots of names, and, 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 and I was saying, um, um, carriage white uh, pigeon, and they all went. At home, I had a little zoo. I had rabbits, I had plants, dogs, spiders, beetles, fish, tadpoles, caterpillars, frogs, mice, you name it. I had it. And that's the way it was. And then one day when we came to school, the teacher said, Boys, we're dividing you into four classes A, B, C, D. And it makes no difference. It took us a nanosecond to realize it did make a difference. What was the difference? What age was for What top students, the academic, the A plus, or D was for who? The gymnasts, the dollars, the dunces, the non-creatives, the non-academic, the failures. The barrier and the journey were put into different classes. All right, so now we're back in 1A. In 1A, every child every day had a test, and we were then marked, and we were sat in a seat that represented the score of our test. So the top mark was for this seat, back right. And then number two, three, four, middle of the snake down to the front, and in the front row were those with the lowest score in that test. And with every test, we had to shift around. Little Barry was in 1D, same system. Where do you think 
little Tony, ba Tony Buzan used to sit in 1A on average. Middle. Front. You're going to have me all over the place. <laughs> I was never, like never in one and never in two. It was always Mummery and Epps. And Epps and Mummery. Never me. I was somewhere else. Little Barry was in the front row of 1D. And that's the way it was. That's the way it was. And then one day in, in the school, our teacher just asked some silly questions. He was saying things like, what is the difference between a spider and an insect? He said, um, name two fish in an English river. There are over 100. He said, what's the difference between a butterfly and a mop? Just kind of ridiculous questions. And we have more tests. And then two weeks later, he comes in and he says, boys, someone has scored a perfect mark, perfect result, 100%. And everybody looks, including me, at Mummery and Epps. Or oh, Epps and Mummery, it was always that too. And he said, Buzan. And I thought, he's wrong. And I knew he was wrong. Because every test I had left answers out. Therefore, there was nothing that was perfect. <clears throat> but I had to move and sit in seat one. Now, how do you think I felt? sitting in seat one. Pretty good. For about four minutes, because I knew that he was going to discover that I was in the wrong seat, then I had to go back to where I normally was. Now, how many of you consider yourself highly creative? Highly creative. How many of you consider yourself average? And how many of you consider yourself below average? OK. So we begin to think about that. I was sitting there waiting to be exposed, because we tend to end up where we think we are. How many of you are not particularly interested in mathematics and physics? The vast majority of you. How many of you are not particularly interested in chemistry? <laughs> With great enthusiasm. Um, how many of you are not interested in the planets of the solar system? OK. How many of you are not interested in the The style of contemporary art. Contemporary art. OK, so vast non-interests. So think about that. I'm now back in this classroom. I am in seat 1A, but I'm waiting to be exposed. And I had become accustomed by the time I was seven to being not creative. I was not creative. I, was, I didn't like maths. I didn't like chemistry, and so my marks were lowish. I liked some English literature. I hated English grammar, and that's the way it was. So I'm sitting here, waiting to be exposed. The teacher gives us the papers, and he hands the paper, and it's 100%. Red ink. My name in my signature. And I looked at it, and I thought, impossible. And I checked what the test was, and it was the test of the differences between the spiders, the insects, the fish in the river, butterfly, and moth. And I thought, that wasn't a test. That was not a test. So I thought, if that's not a test, and I'm number one, then number one doesn't really mean that much. Because I could have given him 
50 fish. I could have given him 17 differences in the butterfly and the moth. And have a think about that. On your table, just have a quick conversation. What is the difference? He said the difference, but what are the differences between the butterfly and the moth? Starting now, quick, an exchange. <laughs> Which are more popular? Butterflies, why? More color. Butterflies are diurnal, live in the day or out in the day. <clears throat> Moss, nocturnal. Which one of them eats clothes? Moths. So which ones are more popular? <laughs> the butterflies. And on and on it goes. So I am now sitting there <clears throat> thinking I'm number one. But I'm not really number one because it doesn't make much difference. And it's nice anyway to see the right profiles of Mummery and Epps. The first time I've seen the right side of their face. So I'm sitting there, and it's kind of OK being number one. How many of you have enjoyed, no matter where you and what you've been in number one, you know, whether you tiddlywinks or whatever it was, you became number one sometime. How many of you enjoyed being number one? Good. Good. So you do like maths. <laughs> Just depends on how maths get into your brain, isn't it? And what numbers are connected to. So I'm number one, and I remain it for about another five minutes, and then my life changes. Paradigm shift. Vroom. Totally changed. My life changed. And that is why I'm here. Because what happened in my head was something that embarrassed me, hurt me, infuriated me, and made me, didn't make me, I became at that moment a delinquent. Just at that moment. How many of you have been delinquent in any of your behavior? Very good. Being delinquent is a very good sign. It means you have a reason for living. It means you have a passion. It means you fight for what it is you believe, whatever that happens to be. So I was a delinquent. So what was it that I realized that hurt me, embarrassed me, infuriated me. Your best friend was the My best friend, Little Barry. Where was Little Barry? Where was Little Barry? 1D, front row. And I was in 1A, number one seat. And who knew more about nature? Little Barry or Little Tony? Little Barry. How much more did he know than I knew? A lot. He should have been down there on the right side of me, a mile down the road, in terms of the amount that he knew. And I knew that he knew. So I knew, deeply knew, scientifically knew, that I was not number one. He was number one. And yet who said that he was bottom, the system, and labeled him as dumb, dim, dull, non-creative, failure, made to be a failure. And he was a genius. He would have been an Attenborough during the television, but he didn't. He became a lorry driver and a barroom brawler. Fighting why? Because when your creativity and your intelligences are suppressed, how do you feel? Angry, frustrated, 
violent, which is the way it is. So creativity is in the process of being crushed. How many of you have children? Who, how, many, <laughs> how many of you have children who have had on their report cards something to the effect, you know, this child cannot concentrate, this child has her or his cloud, head in the clouds, how many? Right. And therefore they are naughty, wicked, bad, won't go to university, they mustn't daydream. Creativity crushed. And it is crushed. And it's serious. So back to little Barry, that gave me the motivation, the impetus of what is smart? What does it mean? What is intelligent? What does that mean? And who has the right to tell anyone, including you and me, that you are smart, you're not smart, you'll never do anything in maths, you're going to fail in history, you won't be an artist, you won't be a scientist, you won't be X, Y, Z. And most of you have done that very successfully. Here you are at this stage of your life, not a scientist, not a poet, not an artist. Your creativity going. So today, we're going to explore that. We're going to explore it and do what is known as metacognition. What is metacognition? We can note metacognition is thinking about thinking. So in this session, we're going to have, I hope, a wonderful time thinking about thinking. Self-examine. It, it helps develop your multiple intelligences, especially your personal intelligence and your creative intelligence. So let me now ask you to play an imagination game. I want you to imagine that you are in a conference like this, but there are 2,000 people. You're a delegate, exactly as you are now. <clears throat> the MC has a real problem because that conference has five consecutive half an hour speakers. You're not one of them, you're in the delegate group. And about 10 minutes before the speaker is about to speak, it disabled, can't get here. So the MC comes up to you and says, look, you know, I know you're in management, etc. We've got half an hour. I'm desperate. You can speak about anything you want, anything you want. You've got half an hour. Say whatever you want. Just give me some of your CV, and I will introduce you. So I want you to make a note to give to me your CV, the summary of you, so you can be introduced to 2,000 people. OK, team? I'll give you four minutes to start that. This is your curriculum vitae. OK, team, you've had enough time. I'd like you, with your note, to work in pairs and give yourself, you know, like 45 seconds just to introduce yourself from your note and then exchange. So you'll meet one more person. Okay, starting now. I am calling you team rather than group because a group is a kind of random gathering, yes? And a team is what? Yeah, a team is a group that has a purpose, has a goal, has a vision. And you all have the same generic vision, which is to improve your brain and to learn how to think, and particularly to be more creative. And I assure you that your creativity is not very much on demand. In your head, not there. 
metacognition, thinking about thinking. How many of you like, love, adore colors? Keep your hands up. Look around. Wonderful. That's a sign of intelligence. A magnificent sign of the lack of the use of intelligence is what you've just done. I've traveled around the tables. You are nearly all of you mind mappers. And I ask you to do your curriculum vitae. Look at what you've done. <laughs> what? <laughs> so you all publicly say, yes, I'm a mind mapper. And what prime color have nearly all of you used in your note? Blue or black? Blue or black? So think about that. You love and adore color. And you use blue or black. And you think about, why am I not creative? Why are you there? How did you get there? And you're a parent. And you will pass that negativity through your family. Because when your child has trouble with art, what will you say? Don't worry about it, my darling. I know exactly what you mean. I can't draw either. Don't worry about it. Stay not being an artist, is what you're really saying. So, have a think. <laughs> and you're not my mappers. If you were a mind mapper, you would mind map it. And those of you who did a mind map, it wasn't a mind map. There are now, happily, because mind maps kind of crawled out of the BBC when I did the program and the book, there was only one mind mapper, and it was me. And I was only inventing it, researching it for myself. Because I was at university, my creativity was going down, and it was low anyway. My marks were going down, and I began to get frightened because, you know, exams were coming, more volume. So I did more and more notes, <clears throat> piles of notes, read more books, and my marks continued to go down. So my confidence went. How many of you had trouble with exams and got scared before important tests or exams, right? So pretty well, all of us. And it's natural, it's a proper instinct. So I scampered to the library, and I said to the librarian, you know, I need a book on how to use my brain. And the li librarian said, the medical section's over there. And I said, I don't want to take it out. <laughs> I want to learn how to use it. But she said, oh, there are no books on that. So I began to build the operations manual for my brain. And it was entirely for me and entirely for my memory. And it was an argument that I had with my brother who was using them, my younger brother who became professor of international relations at London School of Economics. And he used my maps to get his PhD. And we had an argument, me and my younger brother, because I was saying, it's for memory. And he said, but why not for other things? I said, it's for memory, brother. You know, I invented it for memory. That's the tool it's for. And he said, but what about creativity? Or what about? And I said, no, no, no. So I won that argument. And I went home, and I thought, I think my brother was actually correct. And obviously he was. The mind map became a prime creative thinking tool. And now, over 350 million people on the internet have mind maps 
up on the internet. And many of them are not my maps. So they think it's a my map, and therefore they use it as a my map. But you've got to have the right formula. So if you're doing what is not a my map, it will not be as powerful or as creative as you would like it to be. So I'm going to show you a mind map to help you be creative. And I'm going to develop, step by step, a mind map. And this is a mind map. And as it builds, I want you to work out how will I tell somebody else how to do that? Because mind maps, some people define them as a visual thinking technique, which on one level it is. But if I say to you, a mind map is a visual technique, what pops up in your head? Nothing. You don't know what it is. So you have to be able to define it. And the goal in this session, one of the goals, is to be able to explain the mind map as a creative thinking tool. It can also be used for other things, but the focus here, creativity. And you have to imagine that you can describe it to the world. I disappear, all my books disappear, everybody in this room disappears, you are the only one left who knows what a mind map is. And you have to explain it to the seven billion people around the world only via radio. So you have to be able to explain it so that when you speak it, you create it in the world's individual minds. That helps you define, refine a real mind map. So just observe this mind map. It's just going to develop, and I want you to explore what it actually is. Why does it build up in the way that it does? And this tells you more about me from Rob's intro. This is built up with the iMindMap software, which is the only software I recommend. The reason I recommend it is that it actually is designed to allow you to build a real mind map, not the non-mind map mind maps. And as it builds, you will begin to see there are certain trends within it. Trends within it. So you can begin to see the structuring of it. So imagine you're a detective. You know, you're Miss Marple, you're Poirot using the gray cells, you are Sherlock Holmes trying to work out what is a mind map. It's obviously, this is a curriculum vitae of me. But more importantly, it's a mind map. It's a model. So the main purpose is for you not to find out all about me, is to find out about what is a mind map and how are you going to use this to generate your creative thinking on demand. So when you need creative thinking, how will you use the mind map to generate? So I'd like you on your table, have a really ba -ba 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 conversation. What are the laws and rules and guidelines of a mind map and why? So when you're noting, code them in different, different colors, whatever, because there is a, a rule, if you like, a guideline, and there is a rationale. Why? And I'll give you one of the first ones is color. Color. Why color? Why color? It helps you differentiate, discriminate, cluster, group, 
stimulates brain cells, wakes you up from your torpor of linear monotone, <laughs> right? Because one, a blue or black, is one color. One color is a monotone. A monotone is monotonous, which is monotonous. And what is the word that is used to describe something really monotonous? Boring. Boring. And every brain knows it. Boring. And metacognition, what does your brain do when you are truly bored? What does your brain do? Daydream. Tunes out. Switches off. Shuts down. So you tune yourself out, turn yourself off, shut yourself down, and you've been doing it for the bulk of your life so far. And from today on, get out there <laughs> and use it. Wake your brain up. Okay, so discussion group, what are the laws? Why, why, why is this going to help me be more creative and be creative when I need to be on demand. Starting now. Intense, quick, fast, detective. I will now guide you through them and just put your hands up when you've got them, when you've worked out what they are. So number one, obviously, and these are not in priority, they're all important for generating your creative thinking. Colors, for the various reasons we've given. Images. My map always starts with what? An image. A picture. A picture is worth a thousand words. So why use words and words and words and words? And the the super tank of habit. I have instructed thousands of people who wanted to learn how to teach mind mapping to be a Think Guzan licensed instructor. And I gave them that rule. And I said, now do another mind map, because they all had the word in the middle. I said, do a mind map on yourself. 90% of them started their mind map with what? With their name in a circle. So when you know it, habit takes over. So in your creativity, please think. Whatever you're doing, think about it, and your creativity then flowers. So the image, really important. And another law, images throughout. My name's not there. Not necessary, if you know it. And if it's really necessary, if you've got a nice complicated name, you can put a branch here. So images throughout, another law. Keywords, one word per branch. One word per branch. People say, yeah, but what about you know, problem solving? That's something. But if you write the word problem solving on one line, you trap those two words together. When you have one word per branch, the law says problem, and another branch solving. And suddenly, boom, it's all free. So the problem becomes free. You have problem solving, problem what else? <laughs> many of you say problem creating. And many people like to cause problems. <laughs> Delinquents do. And it can be a really good task, can't it? You know, creating problems for exams, testing, or it can just be disrupting and provoking people. But when you have the word problem free, you generate more ideas. So the one word per branch law gives you much more 
creative freedom. Next, the branches, what about them? They are all what? Curvilinear, curvilinear, organic, organic. They're not straight. Why not straight? Straight makes your thinking rigid, your creativity inflexible, and Albert Einstein, one of the most creative individuals on the planet, said, in the universe, there are no straight lines. So in your mind map, don't argue with Einstein, don't argue with the universe, flow with it. And when you use curvilinear, it gives you rhythm, it gives you more kinesthetic intelligence, which is one of your intelligences, and helps you become more creative. The key words have them supported by the branches. Supported by the branches. Not hanging off them. There are two big key words that override the mind map, and you can write those appropriately. The two big key words are imagination and association. Imagination and association. They are the most important words you will get. Imagination and association. Well, I'm glad to see that one person heard what I just said. I said, imagination and association are really important. They are the two most important words you will have. They are significant. And nearly everybody has written imagination and association in the same size as the other things you've noted. Why? Why? Because you are in habit and you are used to taking notes in one color with a pen or a pencil and you are taking them in the same size and you are therefore destroying your creativity. A five-year-old child, five-year-old child was asked to look at my map, discover what it was, and I said exactly the same thing. You know, imagination, association, really important. This little boy took an extra sheet of paper and wrote the word imagination in big curved letters and he had flowers and leaves coming off it. Five years old. How many of you have gone to university or college? Okay. Oh dear. <laughs> so think about it. So the mind map is a an idea-generating, colorful, creative machine that allows you really to explore your brain. Now think about it. Could we add whatever this is about, but could we add a branch here or here or here? Could we add a branch? Could we add a branch here? So how, how long can you go on adding branches? For how long? Forever. So when you do a mind map appropriately, your creativity extends infinitely, three-dimensionally, in an infinite number of ways. So your creativity is fundamentally an infinity of infinities. That's who you are. Not uncreative. So I'm going to challenge you. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to draw. I want you to draw. Now how many of you have bought colors with you? <laughs> Four color pen is 
Far better than anything else. Some people have bought software. Software, the computer, can destroy your creativity very rapidly because you become digital. No rhythm. You use kinesthesia. You use your creativity on that level. The computer can be a fabulous friend as it can now be. So you use it as a friend or an enemy. Use it to help your creativity, not destroy it. And for this next exercise, you can use computer in any way, phone, whatever. And you must use your arm and hand and eye. I'm going to ask you to draw, and I want you to draw something beautiful. I want you to do it quickly. You know, like Picasso. But hold on. I'm going to ask you to draw a butterfly. A butterfly. Hold on. Leonardo da Vinci said, everybody is an artist. Everybody. And they just simply have not been told how to do it. And therefore, when they learn the wrong way, they think they can't, but in fact, they can. So Leonardo said, he actually said, in other words, I'm not actually an artist. It's too shallow a word. He said, I am a student of nature. I observe her, because most people look and don't see, which is why creativity declines. So he said, I look I observe her, I am a student of her, I observe her, I study her, I analyze her, and then I copy her. Copying in our modern culture is considered what? Cheating. I'm now going to ask you to be cheats. Just like Leonardo said, you must be. Copying is the prime goal of the brain to learn and survive. And when it's done well, you accelerate your learning and you accelerate your creativity. So you can find butterfly anywhere. You can get a butterfly from your imagination. And I want you to draw it on the A3 sheet, or at least a good A4, but a nice size butterfly. <coughs> Do it fast. But study it, analyze it, measure it, use the numbers, which you do now love, and draw a beautiful butterfly, starting now. And don't feel frightened. Just follow Leonardo. How many of you, I mean, this just happens to be one. by a non-artist. How many of you have, number one, enjoyed doing it, but seen ones on your table and you think, yeah, that's good. How many of you have that experience? Look, how many of you, ladies and gentlemen, are artists? <laughs> so the camera wants to see the butterflies. Show the camera. <coughs> All of them. So they can see and you can look around. <laughs> okay, team. How many of you were a baby? Good. Give me a piece of paper. Thanks. You give me a piece of paper, what happens? It's the evidence of the fact that the human brain is destructive. 
And there are books that say that. You know, we are basically destructive. Which is why the world's in trouble. You give me a piece of paper, will you get it back like this? No. It'll be like this. Destruction, pure science, pure science. What is the engineering mechanical tensile strength of this? Anybody want some? Social value, want to pay for it, economic? Better stick it in the billion faceted chemical laboratory. No. Check the musical instruments again. Boom. And on to what? The next experiment. Pure science. Nothing to do with destruction, destructive. And you were a baby. So once upon a time, you were a scientist. But now you're not. After rain, when the big rain with big puddles and there are stones and rocks around, and there are three, four, five-year-old children going by with mummy and daddy. And there's a big puddle, stones, rocks. Inevitably, hypothesis, that little stone will make a splash. Experiment, boop, it does. Hypothesis number two, that bigger rock will make a bigger splash. Experiment, boom, confirmed. Hypothesis three, I'm bigger than that stone. I will make a bigger splash. And what do the little kids do? Jump in, bam, with a giant splash all over mummy and dad. Lots of good theater, pure science. How many of you, when you were three or four or five, six, did that kind of thing? So when you were a baby, you were a scientist. When you were three, four, five, six, you were a scientist. And now you're not. How many of you cook? Aha. How many of you play around, you know, a little bit more chili, a little touch of that vegetable, do this here, mix with that? Which is pure what? Science, ladies and gentlemen, how many of you are scientists? <laughs> and you are artists, and all you need to do, you've got a bird, you are the bird, and you are in the cage, right? You've been put in the cage, and you've put yourself in the cage. And the doors now, they're open. And what do birds do when they've been in the cage, you know, a couple of years? Open the door so they can go and fly. What do they do? They look out and they go back in. Why? Because it's safe. Because they know they're still alive. So habit, when it helps you survive, you carry on with it. But now, you're in a different state. You need to release that bird. And you can fly. And when you fly with your creativity, you can always go back if you want. And you can always go out. So you will be more like a child for the rest of your life. Creativity studies. How many of you have kindergarten kids? Okay. <clears throat> they scored 95% in creativity tests when they were given problems. Primary school, what score on creativity were they given when they tried to solve problems? 70, 75, 80. How many of you have primary school kids? Okay. How many of you have senior school kids? Percentage? 
40, 50, 50 it is. How many of you have graduated from a college or a university? Congratulations. <laughs> How many of you are adults? And that's where it is. And that's normal. That's global. It's not here in London. It's in Joburg. It's in Moskva. It's in Beijing. It's in Nairobi. It's in Mexico City. It's everywhere. That's the bad news. The good news at the end is that normal is not natural. It is not natural. Natural is to be like a child. And all the great philosophers, psychologists, religious, religious leaders always said, as you get older, you must become what? More like a child. Picasso. What did Picasso say? From the early age, like six or seven, I painted and I have tried and tried and tried and tried, now that I am 80, to get back to what I was like when I was four or five. So become like a child and you become more creative. And natural means that. It means that. The potential, your brain, the current use, what do you think the percentage is? Ten. How many do you say around ten? So you're pessimistic? In fact, you're very optimistic because in terms of creativity and learning and memory all combined, the amount the average person uses daily less than one percent. Bad news? Bad news? Well done, team. You did agree that it's not bad news. It's wonderful news, isn't it? Because how much is left unused? 99 plus. So leap out of this room saying, wow, 99% still to apply. You can draw 990 butterflies. You can color them. You can copy them. You can read Leonardo, find out about that. You can study your memory. And your memory helps you advance your creativity. Revolutions of the mind. Are we in the information age? Dada, everybody thinks we are, and we're not. Which is why death by PowerPoint. Death by PowerPoint. We're not in the information age. That's past. How many, how many of you have felt stress because of technology and information age? Stress. Mobile. <laughs> the brain has got over that, trying to cluster the information in the knowledge age. And we are now entering the real age, something far more important to manage than information, and something far more important to manage than knowledge is what? the manager of knowledge. You have to manage the manager of knowledge. And the manager of knowledge is what? The thinking machine, your brain. We are now in the intelligence age. And one of the prime of the many multiple intelligences, you have verbal, mathematical, you have spatial, you have personal, you have physical, you have sensual, you have ethical, and you have creative, prime intelligence. And we are in that age. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the age we are in, the age of intelligence, where people will think intelligently, and will think creatively, and will think intelligently about 
agriculture, about industry, about information, so there'll never be death by PowerPoint. There'll be life by it, using the technology and machinery to aid your intelligence. Have it as a friend. But the prime piece of equipment is what? Your brain and your body. So use the hand. Do draw. When you mind map, mind map by hand, you can always translate it and then spread it around, which is a useful addition. But do use your arm, eye, brain system. And you will be supremely creative. You've got my Twitter? You can contact me. Send me your butterfly. There are kids and adults around the world, including CEOs and multi-billionaires, sending their butterflies. And it's a butterfly project where charity is now contributing studios, stadiums, etc., to 20,000 children at a time to teach them how to learn, how to learn, and how to learn the human language. So I have time for a question. I've got to sprint to my next lecture. But uh, Rob, over to you. The question is, does physical exercise interlink positively with your creativity? Answer, definitely yes. When you are phys I mean, this morning at 7 o'clock, I was at the Marla Rowing Club on the machines, doing the exercise, because that gave my brain what? Oxygen and nutrition. And therefore, it was awake, more fuel. And therefore, when you are physically fit, you will think more creatively. And just to let you know, the uh, New Scientist magazine, that's your brain, use the whole of the brain. Synergetic, linked with the body as well. That's how you think, radiantly, and that leads you to a mind map. That's how the brain works. And you build your mind map like that, with more images. That's a formula. Work it out. You can tweet it, because E equals MC squared is Einstein. This is E plus an into M equals C to the power of infinity. I'll give you a clue. The C is very important. <laughs> and the Butterfly Project, do join that. Come and help other children to learn that they are artistic, are scientific, that they can mind map. And that's teachers in Pakistan who said they couldn't draw. Those were children who said they couldn't draw butterflies. And it only took them 15 minutes. Every child can do that. So imagine a world filled with people who knew they could and were artistic and poetic. And the New Scientist magazine, many covers, but this one some time ago, the future of the human race, no limits when you learn how to use your creativity. And I demand that you do. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you. Happy New Year.